Good morning, everyone. Before we begin the session, I request all the participants to follow the instructions. Please turn off your camera and microphone during the session. Kindly use your full name as your Zoom username. Post all your questions in the chat box only. Questions will be answered as per the convenience of time. Feedback evaluation link will be posted only in the Zoom and YouTube chat box. Please do fill it before 4 p.m. to record your attendance for the session. Thank you. Thank you. Now I request our head of the department, Dr. C. Francis, to give the welcome address. Good morning to one and all present here for the webinar session on international perspective in social work practice. Uh, the today's speaker is Mr. Ernst Emanuel and uh, his wife, Ms. Ernst Emanuel, also will join later, it seems. So, Sir is the psychiatric social worker as well as the coordinator in mental health team, NSW Health, Sydney, Australia. Even though a lot of work and busy schedule, SAR has accepted to participate and deliver this lecture on mental health and social work practice. Yes, SAR is working in the mental health team. I hope he would be the expert in this, in this subject and he will deliver a yeah, good knowledge he will share his experience with the participants i also welcome all the participants who have registered and attending the seminar today on behalf of metro school of social work master of social work degree shifted to i welcome all the participants and the speaker of this day and also i welcome the coordinator dr rachel who has taken a lot of effort for about three weeks to organize this seminar and today is the last day. Madam would be happy that she has successfully completing this webinar session. And also I welcome the, the student coordinators, Ms. Odeya and Kirtiga, and all the other students, those who are participating, those who are introducing and doing all these kind of preliminary activities. I welcome all the participants and the, the speaker of this day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request Ms. Niteshree V to introduce our speaker, Mr. Ernest Emanuel, to the participants. Uh, good morning to one and all present. I take immense pleasure. Sorry. Good morning to one and all present. I take immense pleasure in welcoming the speaker of the day, Mr. Ernest Emanuel. Sir is currently working in the mental health team, NSW Health Sydney, Australia, as a psychiatric social worker and coordinator. He has an experience working at the Banyan Chennai as a psychiatric social worker and project coordinator. Sir is also the former director of Aftercare IJM Chennai and Bangalore. He has an experience in working with refugees as a case worker at Red Cross Sydney, Australia. Sir is also a justice advocate and member of IJM Australia. Sir is the co-founder and vice president of Wings of Freedom, an NGO working with the homeless and the elderly in Sydney, Australia. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for your kind words. So am I getting into my session now? Yes, so we request you to take over the session. All right, thank you. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, participants and being a Saturday, thank you. Um, we thought we'll keep it light and uh, have, a, have an interaction kind of a session. Um, this uh, past week has been very, very, very uh, interesting and I have the, had the privilege of uh, listening to all the webinars. So at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Madras School of Social Work and uh, especially the principal and the head of the departments, uh, uh, Dr. Francis and all the faculty, especially the faculty.
faculty coordinator, Dr. Rachel, who gave the opportunity to do this um, uh, session. And also I have to commend you students for being such a um, uh, supportive you know, participants, even though this uh, situation has changed because of the COVID and the lockdown. And there's also there's so much good has come, uh, I can say in many aspects. So I look forward to talking to you in the next few minutes. And I have uh, my better half, she's also a social worker right here next to me. I'd like to introduce her, please. Uh, yeah, if Hi, I'm Shirley Manuel. I'm a social worker too. And wish I could see you all. I hope this session will be interesting and informative. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So you'll be hearing from uh, uh, one of my clients and also from Shirley, she'll be narrating a story uh, in the presentation itself. So I thought it'd be apt to just start by um, giving a heads up. So let's, I'm trying to screen share now one second. There we go. Can you see the screen now? Is the screen visible oh, now? Yes, sir, the screen is visible. Yeah. Thank you. Mental health and social work, a perspective from psychiatric social workers. So why social work? I'd like to give a bit of an um, introduction as to myself, why I chose social work itself. So um, basically I always was intrigued by human mind and how this, uh, how we have the capacity to comprehend things. And they talk about uh, the neurotransmitters and chemical imbalance, all those things, you know, how, how, they, how complex the human mind is. And I, I started to study uh, about that and I did my uh, BSc in zoology as I did in Ruskin College. And, and then uh, I also have a great interest to work with people. All my life, I had worked with people uh, in my career. So this had, I think there was an innate, uh, innate quality in me to always work, uh, seek work to people. And so those two combinations as uh, chose the social, social work, uh, it was good because I had the privilege to um, and to work in various sectors uh, in, in Chennai, in Bangalore. So I had an interesting career, so to speak. And then we moved to Australia about 10 years ago. And, and again, my work with homelessness in the past and the victims of sexual abuse, victims of uh, physical abuse, all that compounded. And then we had an inspiration to uh, start our own organization here and work with the uh, homeless and mentally ill in the streets of Sydney. So we will talk more about it in the presentation and uh, that's how I got into this profession. So this is how the presentation is gonna be. Mental health issues, I'll just have a description. I'm not gonna go into uh, big numbers and statistic data because we wanna keep it simple. I want to, uh, you know, as much as possible, give you some inspiration as to uh, what a mental health worker and a social work in the mental health practice means. and. At the end of it, if you um, if if someone takes inspiration to be a better mental health social worker, that's all I I'd be I think this would be a success. And then after that, I'm going to talk about drug addiction and mental health. I'll have a little case interview with an audio presentation, and I have I'm going to talk about homelessness and mental health. I have a case narration, which is my wife's going to present that, and then I'm going to talk about self care and how important it is in the mental health practice. So significance of mental health. If you see the World Health Organization state that there is no health without mental health, highlighting the association between mental and physical health. So it's very, very important that we have a good mind to have a good body. So people living with mental illness have poorer physical health and higher rates of mortality compared with people with good mental health. There are copious amount of research done in this aspect and. So you know, I don't want to go into details. It's all, as you say, now the technology is click of a button. So you can go on to Google. There's plenty of research to support these statements. So moving on, as a social worker, what I do. So social work is one of five core professions in mental health field and the second largest allied health sector providing mental health services. So psychiatry, psychology, social work, nursing, occupational therapy, these are the, uh, so to speak, five core professions. There are others also, like the pharmacy and physiotherapy, they, they also contribute to the efforts to bring in better mental health. So 
that's what i'm part of so so in australian context so australia is called multicultural melting pot you know you you heard about the uh, bushfire and all these things in the in the end of last year so it's commonly known as multicultural melting pot down under basically there's all the um, cultural people like the heaps of of course the aborigines the anglo saxons and then the immigrants come the, there's a huge population of uh, southeast asians and chinese and indians and south americans i can go on and there's uh, that's such a vast uh, cultural diversity and so the demography is such and the when we come into mental health sector and i work with them i see all sorts of people and each of them have their own uh, background and have their own uh, challenges to work with studies have shown that lesser immigrants are affected with mental health issue so i picked this up and i was like trying to investigate as to what is that really true uh, like immigrants are less uh, mentally Ill, mentally affected but uh, there's some bit of a contradiction there's but arguably there are limited reporting so it's hard to really substantiate so and to my uh, personal experience when i work with in the mental health team there's more of the like the anglo saxons and aborigines so i can take it as an you can take it as an anecdotal evidence that i'm experiencing that there's not much immigrants who do get affected by mental health all right let's uh, delve more into psychiatry i've just thrown some big words phobia anxiety stress so these are labels so it says hello my name is stress hello my name is shame so people uh, are branded these names and then so what really is mental illness and i know you um you're listening the participants in the, in the in the participant there's like phd scholars there's professionals in the field and but this is predominantly also um uh, directed to first year pg students from my understanding so i'm going to throw this as a pretty basic uh, slide where you talk about causative factors so just a quick brush up so genetic factors having a close family members with a mental illness can increase the risk however just because one family member has mental illness doesn't mean that others will so when i worked with banin in the past in china i had these kind of experience like it's a common taboo like oh if someone gets mentally ill that's it this this um, this definitely this whole family is going to be affected it, they do get affected in some aspect but they don't going to get be mentally ill because that's an illness or this you know it's a condition so there is dense genetic factors in that and then drug and alcohol abuse that is big in this country as i work with so i'll be explaining more because um, the clients i work predominantly been affected by drugs illicit drugs can trigger many episodes bipolar disorder and episodes like psychosis such drugs you know like cocaine marijuana amphetamines cause paranoia so they develop all this something triggers in their brain so what happens is they have uh, some condition in the underlying condition then when they take these drugs something clicks in the brain and then they start becoming anxious they start become paranoia so we'll talk about that more and then of course biological factors if they have some medical condition if they have renal failure if they have diabetes so it's hormonal changes of course they can also be affected and then there's early life environment so negative childhood experiences such as abuse and neglect can increase the risk of mental illness so again whatever family of origin you have from and whatever experiences you had in the past as a child that definitely be a causative factor trauma and stress in adulthood traumatic life in like death of a loved one and ongoing stress such as social isolation domestic violence relationship breakdown financial constraints and work problems all these you know and then of course the ptsd we talk about big uh, with here in australia we talk about that with the veterans who, who come back from war zone that's a um, major problem with uh, with them and also we deal with a lot of sexually um, abused victims who go through ptsd issues and finally this personality factors some of them are like basic some of them have a very low self self esteem or some of them may be perfectionists like some of them are, that the ocd can stem out from that and the anxiousness can stem out from so being uh, low having a low self esteem stuff like so again 
these are personality factors. So that's kind of a gist of, um, yeah, I can't really do justice with uh, mental health is such a vast field of practice. So I'm trying to be a bit um, quick here and just trying to go through and we can have the questions at the end as we, as we know. So as a psychiatric social worker, we assess and treat people who have mental health disorders that include anxiety disorders, life crisis, suicidal thoughts, and suicide itself, like it's a big issue here. Apparently there's more suicide than the number of car accidents every year. So that is more prevalent here. And depression and mood disorders, psychosis and personality disorders, relationship problem, of course there's a lot of issues, family breaking up and divorce and extermination, all those kind of problems. Tra trauma, of course, traumas, any injuries and trauma they go through, uh, abuse and family conflicts. So that's when we involve facts where family, uh, uh, the counselors and legal systems involved. So again, now let's uh, fo focus on substance abuse and mental illness. So that's my kind of expertise here and uh, it close my heart because I see uh, how much drugs affect uh, families, shatter lives, livelihoods, uh, people lose their hope and dreams because of uh, substance abuse. So 60% of substance abuses suffer from uh, mental illness. And because as I, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's a comorbid conditions. Something underlying is there, either it's a personality uh, factor or a genetic factor, or they're, they're prone to this, uh, bringing out these underlying uh, conditions when they put a substance into, into the brain and in the system. So something clicks in the brain and they start having paranoid thoughts and, and then tumbling down and they go downhill. What does this say? 50% of individuals with multiple mental, sorry. 50% of uh, individuals with multiple mental health disorders are affected by substance abuse. As, as I thought, that's big, like that's half the population, they are affected by substance abuse. Of all people diagnosed mentally ill, 29 abuse either alcohol or drugs. So again, the, uh, there's a big correlation between substance abuse and mental health, especially in Australian context. So this is a case presentation as to just a quick chat with a, with a person who was in drug addiction and went through a rehabilitation program and then, and he's, he's, he's doing well now. So let's listen to, hope you can hear the audio. And goes, it's not, it's not wrong with just five minutes. Morning, mate. Morning. Thank you for joining me. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? Uh, my name's Nathan, I'm 24 years old and I'm from the Western suburbs. Yeah, but can you, Tell me what was the drug of choice in the past for you? Um, I've used everything from, so I started using drugs at 17, started smoking pot and started using cocaine and MDMA, which moved on to prescription drugs like Xanax, um, Seroquel, Valium, um, and then further progressed to methamphetamines and um, then heroin. So yeah, I've used, used it pretty much everything you can think of. Yeah, I've used it. That's true. Can you, you mentioned to me uh, that, you know, in the past you had gone through levels of addiction and that each one had an effect on you and your mental health. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, cannabis gave me what I thought was curing my anxiety. It was actually just worsening it. And so I got anxiety and depression. Same with like um, pharmaceuticals. Um, yeah, they, they just furthered my anxiety and depression. Um, then methamphetamines and um, heroin was giving me psychosis. So I went into psychosis um, a couple of times. At one, one, once I went in psychosis for like almost four days. So yeah, um, just all negative mental health issues. Yeah, what happened when you had the worst episode can you tell me about the incident? Yeah, so I'd been up for close to two weeks straight. I had, 
yeah, maybe little lapses of sleep. Um, I had, hadn't eaten, maybe I'd eaten like one or two cheeseburgers in the two weeks. I hadn't drank anything other than maybe energy drinks. Um, I went into a psychotic episode. Uh, I was seeing and um, hearing things that weren't actually there. Um, I thought that I was being um, chased by people and they were trying to shoot me whilst I was driving in my car. So I was driving erratically for a number of kilometers till I ran into a, I bumped into a police car. And um, when I saw the police car, I stopped next to them. And I thought these people had been climbing underneath my car into my bonnet, trying to shoot me with guns. And um, they were like mates of mine, actually, that I thought were trying to do this. I pulled in up next to the police car, waved with the, obviously in hysterics to try and get the policeman to come over to me and to help me. Um, the police just ignored me. So I thought the best thing to do is to drive my car into a telegraph pole because I thought they were in my engine bay. So by doing that, I would squish them and they wouldn't be able to get me. After I'd done that, the cop got out. Obviously, like, <laughs> I don't know what the cop was thinking, but yeah, he'd um, put me in handcuffs, got me out of the car. Then whilst I was sitting on the side of the road and they were trying to figure out what happened, I then continued to see people trying to shoot me, I thought, from the other side of the road and um, down the sides of houses. I then got sent to hospital to get a psych evaluation. Um, I was lucky enough that my friend came there and, um, yeah, he, I was left into his um, care for the rest of the time. So, How long have you been um, clean? Oh. Um, I've been clean for 11 and a half months now. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're doing well and you're successful and out of the drugs and everything. So now how bad um, is the drug use? on mental health in general in Australia, you think? Uh, so, yeah, well, I've been involved in the drug scene since 17, so close to seven years now. Uh, I don't know how many numerous times I've seen people in psychosis, seen people, nearly everyone that uses drugs experiences depression, anxiety. Um, I've seen many people become bipolar from drug use. Um, being become schizophrenic, um, yeah, spend stints in the mental health ward. Um, you know, like doing drugs, it gets rid of the risk versus, versus reward factor in your head. So basically, there is no risk. Anything you want to do, it just seems all reward. You don't take into account the risk at all. So people are just doing stupid things that they wouldn't normally do. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. It's just it is. Yeah. So as you listen uh, to Nathan's story, so he said people do stupid things which they wouldn't normally do. That's what happens because of drug use, and it's so sad here. At the even at the age of thirteen and fourteen, kids can get their hands on party drugs or street drugs, or the worst thing is the ice, the methamphetamine that that they smoke, or sometimes they inject. So that's the that's very 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 prevalent and uh, like as low as even twenty dollars or something they can get their hands on it and it's so available and I've heard teachers from school say to parents and saying uh, we just we were worried like how how bad this is and and when we ask it's like they was uh, the way they told us is were like you can just go out to out to the street and just stand there for two minutes and and look the way you look and they know they can come and they're going to come and approach you that thinking that you need drugs and you are, you are after that. So that's how uh, easy access is. And what happens, the worst case scenario is like the ice when they use that, it just messes with their mind. And in Nathan's interview, he said like, he was thinking his um, mates were after him and that's how bad it gets. And then, and they get to get into a scuffle and they get into fights, they get into, harm each other and also self-harm, homicide, that it can take you to that extent. So it's not all gloom and doom, but I'm just trying to highlight how the drug um, addiction and how it is directly affects mental health and how uh, it's so much prevalent here in Australia. So 
but there is hope and the people who are, uh, he, as he said, he's been clean for 11 months. So he's doing well and he's, he's succeeding, he's uh, studying and stuff like that. So that's my take and my crux in general about mental health and addiction. Just let's move on. We can have questions after. I'm trying to move the slide, next one. Yep. All right, stigma. So this is another big area that's close to my heart to like, because uh, be it India or be it anywhere, like, of course, there are different levels, probably that it's more in India. And we can't say because it's uh, um, other nations, they, they probably are well aware. No, there is stigma everywhere. And uh, the, even here, the campaigns happening to make people understand there's helplines and, and things like that to, um, to make it accessible and like stigma free. So any stigma still connect with mental illness or substance abuse continues to prevent people from choosing life-saving treatment options. So there are help there, there is a, a treatment option, but because of the stigma associated with this, there's like, if people get shunned away, they're, they're, they're too shy to approach and they wait till the point where it's, it's like everything's gone and they had to have a police intervention or a, a, like section 33, they call it here, where the legal system has to involve and the psychiatrist has to give an, uh, um, a recommendation and the court gives an order basically saying you have to go into community corrections or you have to go mandatory treatment kind of. So that's stigma. Now um, I'm gonna digress a little bit about um, talking about homelessness and mental health. As you uh, heard me say, I started my career in working with homelessness and mental health and that again so resonates till today with me and uh, here in Australia, we do work with homeless and mental health. So yeah, what happens here? People with mental illness are more at risk of homelessness due to increased vulnerability, difficult situations in employment and withdrawing from their friends and family, all these factors. And then the stress that comes with homelessness also in turn increases the risk of mental illness. Living without a home can increase fear, anxiety, depression, sleeplessness, and can lead to substance abuse as a coping mechanism. In the, even in the treatment process, what we do, uh, we meet clients, invariably, they would have been homeless at certain points in time, like before they actually get treatment, before they actually approach for help. They... Um, they would have been homeless at certain points. So for three months or something, they would have been uh, no shelter, no food. They would be like couch surfing or what we call rough sleepers. And you know, that's how, and these factors just gets overwhelming, overwhelming. And then they eventually, uh, the underlying factor comes out or they become mentally ill, they start become paranoid. They're thinking people are following them, all that things. So homelessness and mental health. So, I just threw this slide about uh, a technique. So when we work with homeless people or victims of abuse, victims of um, sexual abuse and uh, in isolation, we, in the different therapies, there's one technique called drop anchor. So my wife will be talking about an actual uh, case of how we use that. So this is basically saying, what is drop anchor? How it helps? So, so basically it involves three steps, acknowledge your thoughts and feelings come back into your body and engage in what you're doing. So uh, when we work with clients, we just encourage them to acknowledge what their feelings and thoughts are because these uh, thoughts come because they have the real pain that because they keep uh, reminded about uh, the abuse, the past and, and actually the physical, the brain hurts. So, so that's where they go in a mode of, you know, cringing and then they try to um, just, shun away from people. So we ask them to acknowledge that. And then we ask them to come back to the body as to like be present in the physical this here and now, and just try to engage. And there's a mo more techniques into it. So I just was, because we're gonna be talking about uh, the case, I thought we should uh, have a slide about uh, what drop anchor is. So now let's, um, we, as I said, we work with homeless. So we're gonna to listen to another case narration. 
which especially focuses on homelessness and mental health. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shirley Emanuel. I did my MSW at Stella Maris and Diploma in Counseling and Leadership at Sydney, Australia. I was eager to pursue my career as a social worker here and started volunteering with different organizations that work with homeless, elderly, and refugees. I started blending into the culture and acquired the knowledge to work with the homeless and people in the community. These NGOs were doing excellent services in providing care packages, sleeping bags, and food supplies. I observed that most of the services were monotonous. One thing that was lacking was the emotional support and one-to-one -one interaction when working with the homeless. I wanted to have a different approach and I decided to start my own organization. I registered it seven years ago with my husband's help. Glad I had a social worker with me. We called it Wings of Freedom. Working with people on an individual basis, I was able to bring into intervention at an emotional and personal level. Today, I would like to highlight a case that really touched my heart. This is about a girl age 17 years. Let's call her Mia. This is the first time I'm working with a homeless minor girl. She would often come to our feeding program, but will never be forthcoming. Always tries to stay away from the group, hiding near the bush or behind the tree. One day when I went up close and started a conversation with much reluctance, she spoke to me. It took many days and hours of just sitting with her and listening to her to gain her trust to even share her name. I could see the brokenness in her and slowly she opened her story to me. She hardly remembers her mother, which is very sad as she abandoned her at the age of two. She was forced to live with her father, who was an alcoholic and abusive. She was deprived of love. She ran from her home as her dad would call the cops on her, saying she is creating problem in the house. She ended up in the mental institute where she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. It was hard for her to comprehend her situation and come to terms with her illness. When I met her, I started sharing about my situation and my upbringing and the abusive past that I went through. I usually don't do that because I felt I had to share my story with her. And I encouraged that life is not fair and it won't be the same. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. I asked her to move forward and learn to be a fighter. It was hard to make her speak and gain a trust but miraculously over many weeks time, she did trust and open up to me. It was so unsafe for her to sleep in the parks as there were others who abused drugs. We did few referral services and they considered her case and found a safe home where she started her new life. She has now learned to identify her symptoms of relapse and checks herself into the hospital before she hits downhill. She's also pursuing her studies called Statement of Attainment in Mental Health and Drugs and Alcohol, which is pretty impressive. The, techni the technique I used for Mia and other similar cases is called dropping anchor. It is often used among victims of abuse and mental illness because they carry memories of pain in, the in their brain and in their body. Their past experiences such as physical abuse and sexual trauma brings real pain in their body. I realized that the effective methods to deal with victims of abuse and mental illness is to go to their level and not to take a top-down approach. Also be aware that we need heaps of patience, compassion, and help them to deal with their emotional breakdown. This will help them to get out of their vicious cycle. I hope this story has given an insight to the people inside of the about the people with homelessness and mental health issues here in Australia. Thank you for the opportunity and I wish everyone the best. Yeah. So again, that's another uh, story of how 
mental health, uh, mental health issues compound with compound with the homelessness can can affect so much. So the next. Yeah, so this is in, a, in just like keep calm. They normally say keep calm and uh, carry on. But this is I'd like to say keep calm and uh, drop the anchor. This can be used in any situation, even if we are if we are losing temper, if you're losing control of some situation, we just need to take that step. So just a few pictures as to highlighting what kind of uh, work we do in Sydney, working with homeless and rough sleepers. We just go and meet them in the park and um, try to interact with them, give them um, whatever uh, resource stuff for them. And yeah, uh, we provide meals and also uh, referral services to different organizations. So a few more. So every one matters. So we, we cater to the individuals, like we don't, we keep it very low key. Uh, we wanna just reach out to individuals. A few more pictures there. All right, so we go into the next part now. That's one last picture there. All right. So are we good on time for 10? Yeah. So self-care in social work. So I, because I know um, we're all professional social workers and, and we, this is so to speak like a noble profession that you've chosen that you being, you're being selfless and you want to uh, do something for the people. And, and I really come in that you chose this profession, but I want to highlight Mental health or is also important for us as social workers who are in the field. So that's why I put it big bold let us self-care in social work. So few things that I'd like to highlight here is like turn off from work when you know you're not warning signs and of burnout. So maybe for the students will not understand at this stage, but this will come in handy when you get into the profession and how how it can affect you. Um, the toll of the stories um, day after day, like the kind of things that I uh, hear, it just gets gets to me by the time I drive back home, like I'm full of, I'm wearied, I'm tired because of all the uh, stressful, uh, like upbringings, all the stories that I hear. But so we, I just need to be able to um, encourage you, like turn off from work and know your warning signs and take time to recuperate as in you do something different like you, whether you can have pets or you have a hobby or you just need to be able to recuperate uh, away from the, the work stress and the, the, uh, the stuff that you always see at work and with the clients and dealing with them. And also trusted mentor, like you should have a peer or a person who you trust in also because there should be bounce off each other. Like that's why we have like a team where we can uh, complement each other like we have like trusted mentors so we can talk to them and say this is this has been difficult this case is particularly being hard on me and I uh, and then they walk you through it and then be a team player strength-based approach so because not everything I can do I can deal with certain clients but not everyone so maybe the language barrier the culture barrier or the experience in the past everything comes into play. So you have to be a team player and work with your strengths and, and just uh, work as a team for the common good. Just the, the client's well-being should be the focus and we just, we just here to facilitate that. And finally, appreciate yourself. Like many times we, we just give, give, give. There's always, not only if you're full, you can overflow. You have to be full with compassion. You have to be full with energy. You have to be full with a zeal. You have to be full with hope. That's when it can pour out on others as you work and naturally it's like an infection that the, cat, the people will catch on like the, the energy and the, the enthusiasm that you have as a social worker. So it says self-compassion is simply giving the same kindness to yourself that we would do, we would give to others. So we always been taught in social work that we had to do and be kind and be uh, generous and be facilitate everything, all that encompasses that you also need to show the same kindness to yourself. And also I say self-care isn't selfish. So 
I think um, I've spoken enough and thank you for listening. So we'll give some time. I know it has been a roller coaster from different aspects of been talking about mental health and drug addiction and homelessness. And so you might have questions. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We have questions here. So the first question is, how to deal with children or adolescents having problems with addiction? Yeah, so the, it depends on where, which, uh, which sector, which um, like in Indian country. So they here, because they are underaged, they can't be, uh, there's a lot of restriction as to how we can treat them. There has to be consent, there has to be privacy, and that's why I really cannot share stories about kids. So with children and adolescents, uh, again, there are specific like child social workers and uh, psychologists and we use uh, affirming therapy, just uh, because I, you heard from uh, yesterday's presentation of school social work, how it, we cannot brand someone saying bad kids and stuff like that. So that's big in this country. Like they cannot, um, even though they're doing uh, wrong straight in front of your eyes like he, it's really hard to um, they can take us to any level you know that we have to be very, very careful as to how we approach them how we um, deal with them so again we can just point them there's something called headspace so there's an organization called headspace they only work with the young and uh, so basically they're trying to uh, deal with their headspace, they deal with their mindsets, and they, they have fun activities. They try to um, do skate parks, like take them to a skate park or do cycling and stuff like that. And then when they have a, the similar age group, they come together. That's when they know, okay, they see others who are doing flourishing well, and they think um, it's all, it, that's why they know. And there's also another thing called uh, uh, we run, a, I've heard of a program in schools uh, called Not Even Once. So basically what this, done, what this does is like groups of people who have been in addiction and they have uh, been in substance abuse and have gone down a bad path, they go and share to the people, to, to high school students and say um, how they damage their life and how it's better not to use Not Even Once. No, that's what, so don't use drugs and you can, it's going to save you a hell of a lot of trouble. So I hope I've answered the question, yeah. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Ms. Nitishri. She asks you to give some tips uh, to improve mental health of kids and children during this lockdown. Yeah, so actually uh, that's, I had a bonus content about the COVID itself. I'm gonna speak basically at uh, the end of, what can we do? Like. Um, because we are, they're saying that it's a screen time becoming the worst. Like normally kids with gadgets, like uh, I'm sure even in India, like they stuck to the screen and they're stuck with the games. And also there's a heightened level of uh, online abuse in these days. So that's, that's how also been highlighted here, just to be careful as to who they enter. Because he, even here they, they were homeschooled and, and kids were given the laptops to work from home. And that's when they said, you have to be more careful as to what they're doing on the laptop, what they, who they're communicating. So we have to put the checks and balances. And as to, uh, we can't just say, oh, they've grown enough and they're gonna, they can log in, they can do their own thing. But that's one thing I, I, um, I'd like to suggest. And also as a family, you need to find ways to do things um, out of the box, create. Like this lockdown has made people more creative. I'm saying, I'm thinking like people are doing more uh, uh, out of norm things like that. Normally they wouldn't do as a family because everyone's in different place. They're uh, coming back and work different timings. So when there's, uh, uh, they're together, like the Australian Prime Minister said, uh, why don't you all play puzzle and board games and things like that. So I, I encourage you guys, like you, you're locked down, but you can bring the family time together and, you know, and help and support one another. And the kids are gonna value. And one more thing is like, even a two-year-old or three-year-old, we're thinking that it's not, uh, they don't understand what's happening, but 
they saying studies are showing that like even a toddler is understanding there's been a change in this whole situation what's happening they're all confused like why my brother's not going to school why my sister is home things like that so we have to be aware of all age groups and just include everyone like be inclusive of the kids and, and whatever you do whatever decisions you take yeah thank you sir the next question is from miss anita she asks as a mental health professional what are some of the therapies that you practice and also the, some of the theories that you use yeah so i purposely didn't go into uh, like all the therapies and technicalities like there narrative therapies one that's big in australia and also like uh, cbt so cognitive behavioral therapy that's uh, that's also we use a lot and then there's a like uh, in its situation uh, like dialectic therapy like expansive therapy there's different big words but at the end of the day we just need to cater to the client's needs and how where they coming from we have to just get down to the level and then um work with them because the situations vary their life experiences vary so yeah um yes that's how we we do use different techniques or from different settings yes, as i said yeah thank you sir the next question is from dr j lakshmi she asks you to share your experience working in india and in us and how it differs from one another yeah um just to clarify not in the us i'm in australia i work in sydney australia so uh, there's much more regulated i'd say here with the social work association and how there is more accountability accountability here Uh, as to what what you can do uh, and what you can't do so at the same time there's drawbacks i'm not saying this is better than that but when i was in india i had the freedom to choose what i can do like i had much more liberty to uh, go out in the community just like if i have to do something with the family i can just like uh, intervene straight then and there but here it's different i can't i have this certain protocols i have to go through hoops and loops and i have to jump uh, you know so many systems to make sure everything is i have to keep a paper trail of what i'm doing and stuff like that i'm not saying that's bad but like basically uh, with indian context like there's more freedom when, when you with the with mental health practices to um, even to admit someone to take him take him to a mental institution or what i did in bani like we had run a program called dial 100 and i was coordinating that program where we picked people off the streets who are who had mental illness and we admitted them to if there was a uh, we entered uh, to the mental health institute and uh, that's to do that you, you of course we did have a paperwork there but it was much more easier there i'd say if i have to do something like that here i i can't even that's i can't fathom it's going to be a mountain to climb yeah so definitely there's differences and yeah thank you so much sir the next question is from miss samiksha she asks you to point the difference between physical dependence and addiction physical dependence and addiction what uh, with with regard to drugs see um i don't know uh, there's a norm there's a general code saying uh, 10 out of 10 social uh, if there are 10 social drinkers out of that i think seven of them will be addicted or something like that so that's with alcohol so physical dependence what happens uh, i can take an example from adhd first say for example that's big in this country where they kids if they run around too much if they don't uh, study they don't uh, concentrate they they just being kids but but at very early stage what happens they all oh, they the parents get overwhelmed to control them and they say oh he needs help and we take him to a psychiatrist and run him through uh, uh adhd counseling and all that and then they put him on um, ritalin that's called the amphetamines so what happens with the amphetamines that calms them down brings the kid down and then boom it's easy for the uh, parents to hand now oh it's like a miracle drug my son is just sitting down he's not running around and he's not um, he's not being so uh, troublesome but what happens on the later stage is they that becomes uh, 
uh, an addiction actually so that that becomes a causative factor for, because they have been dependent on this ritalin as a, as a substance to calm them down and later in life many clients have seen and they had an ADHD pass and they end up in methamphetamine addiction so I um, now I lost the question now did I that's what I was what was the question again the difference between physical dependence and yeah. addiction. So, Physical, so what happens, so the, that was a physical dependence right there because they, they thought, okay, they, he is, uh, this drug is helping him, but at, towards a uh, few years down the line, when he gets to high school, he gets into um, friends where they can get, get exposed to party drugs and, and uh, uh, all other, so like illicit drugs, and then it becomes drug addiction. So it just, easy transition and I'm seeing time and again how many I can't I can't even know how many cases I've seen this has been the cycle thank you sir now we have come to the last two questions of the session so the question is uh, can you please tell or share with us some of the challenges that you faced as working as a mental health practitioner yes as I pointed out earlier there's a lot of um, systems that we need to adhere to like protocols as a mental health and also when we work as a team we need to uh, be accountable to each other like and and there's there's kind of cases that we we uh, we have like homicide and and suicidal that's the onus is on the practitioner i should be able to uh, make sure I have a uh, proper paper trail as to have, if I, have I done the risk assessment? Have I done enough uh, work with them that they're not going to um, end their life or things like that? Uh, have I done enough to, to safeguard that there is no um, opportunities for them to harm themselves? So that is definitely a challenge. And also uh, where the people can smuggle drugs back in the, in, in the system like because they, even though they're in a, in a uh, acute ward, or they go on day leaves and they get, and we have to do screens like dr drug screen when they come back and like the, the, there's assistants who do the thorough check of their body and so body search and stuff like that. But also as uh, practice, we have to uh, make sure the urine is analyzed and for if there's any illicit substance they have taken one while they were out in the street for the few hours, things like that. So, uh, you can't afford to make any slips. It just uh, comes back and and suicide and um, self harm. That's big. You, uh, I will be held accountable. Like, of course, if I have the paperwork, if I have done my part, and yeah, it's not uh, it's not like hard and fast. But basically, basically, that's kind of a challenge that I face. And also, um, yeah, in general, it's like as I said, it's overwhelming with the stories that I hear of brokenness in the family and isolation, how, how basic isolation makes them um, mentally ill because they just, it's hard for them to even communicate like to when open up, it takes um, hours of practicing and just bring the trust in and then under, make them understand that like, I'm not here with an ulterior motive, just here to help you. And once they're out of that phase, it's such a turnaround and and that's also good to see how, how it can change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The last question is for all the aspiring social workers here. What would be your uh, suggestions on the skills that the student should acquire to become a successful psychiatric social worker and the process that it takes to become a practitioner? Yep. So everything that we study in social work, you know, like, you uh, uh, social work practices and, and report writing and case working group work. So everything you put your hundred percent there and, and you're going to be a better social worker. There's like enough um, theory give, being given there. And also that uh, com combined with the practical knowledge that you gain when you do your field work, like you go the extra mile, you try to do something uh, out of the box like even if you do a community program you there's a few people depending on your skills and they're looking up to you so you if you come up with a, 
planned. That's how policies get birth. That's how ideas get birth. So you are a change agent. So I'm as a social worker, I really would like to emphasize that you are being a change agent, that you can inspire people, you can bring change in the community. Like even sometimes I say, like uh, when I'm walking out of work and, and someone is like down, like I wouldn't even think for a second, like I would just stop by and spend some two minutes with them. And then the next day I'll, he comes and I'll thank you for that chat. So things like that, like very, we might think very, very simple things, but it has profound effect on humanity because we're talking about lives. So life is so fragile. And, and if we put that extra effort into them and if we see them succeed, that's when, uh, that's when the reward is like, we, we're going to be happy and we're going to be a happy social worker. And at the end of the day, we've done our part as a social worker. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Now we request you to give the concluding remarks for the session. Um, thank you. I think uh, uh, I've sh shared my uh, thoughts. I just want to finish with saying, if you, whoever is listening, you know, get inspired by uh, to do that extra mile, to do their best, I'll be happy. And and we see so much need, and whether in India or overseas, says there's need is always there. Like we we would think the grass is green on the other side. No, I'd say like it's it's the same. Like there's as we heard from the other presentation in the U, UAE or the uh, UK, there's more poverty. And same here in Australia, there's more. We, we, I don't want to go in numbers. Like there is need everywhere and people are doing it tough and we especially in this time of uh, lockdown and uh, that's what i had this last slide where i was going to talk to you as my final remarks um yeah that's the one the uh this is the slide i just put, would like to put up because we never covered anything about the covid and the situation of lockdown so this i leave it with you see i cannot control what are the things there only focus on what you can control so my positive attitudes turning off the news because uh, even here the news and media didn't help really for the people who had mental illness because they were so frightened glued themselves in the couch in front of the tv 24 7 listening to all the numbers and kind of things so um yeah, so I'd like to, what are some of the government interventions in Australia for homeless residents? What are some of the network strategies? So is that, there's another question yes. about, uh, yeah. So I would like to finish with that um, uh, statement about, you can use that slide and see the positive things and what you can control and what you can't. And uh, just to finish with this question, uh, government intervention in Australia for homelessness. Yes, there are a lot of uh, NGOs, they do work um, because they have programs where they try to transition them into housing and they provide uh, material needs. So that's where we try to make, uh, as a registered NGO, we try to make a difference where we come in as an emotional support and we have to, we on a casework, that's on a casework model, we try to uh, give them the support, but there's a lot of organizations out there and, and we do we do network with them and try to make use of uh, wherever in the areas we go and we, we, we make use of their support and their resources. That's what we do. And I'm thanks. Yeah, and one most of them are the charities like Vinny, Salvos, Salvation yeah. Army. Christian yes. organizations that come forward to help the homeless people. And the tool that they use is the feeding. So when you feed them, naturally they come to the park, gather to the park and where they meet together. And there's, that's the chance you get to talk with them. Otherwise they get isolated in their own spots where they sleep and they wouldn't even come out of that space. So feeding, at the end of the day, everybody's going to get hungry. They need food, so they come out to have their meal and that's where we are able to meet them. That's yeah. a most effective strategy, I would say, that most of the NGOs meet, use, here, use yeah. here to meet and help the homeless. Yes. That's yeah. 
thank you so much sir thank you so much ma'am for this wonderful session with this we have come to the end of our webinar series in international perspectives of social work practice now we request participants to volunteer to share your feedback about the series yes and i really thank you for this opportunity that was given and uh, yeah great work you students. thank you so much sir So now we have Dr. Sukumar with us. Hello, sir. Can you share your feedback? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Dr. Sukumar, yes, so you can share your feedback. Uh, can you hear me? I think some disturbance is there. We have a lot of our participants giving their feedback in the chat box. Ms. Anita says that we sincerely appreciate the efforts initiated by the team and the speakers for sharing their time and knowledge with us. Now we have Ms. Nitishri sharing her feedback. Sessions uh, conducted by uh, MSW uh, 15 was really very interesting. So we came to know the different perspectives rather than uh, the national perspective. We came to know the international perspectives, which was uh, quite interesting. And um, we're looking forward to implement those in the in 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 our country too, where they have a lot of protocols or a lot of uh, rules, regulations, and uh, procedures to work. Where I think so that is lacking in India. So we look forward to implement it here too. And uh, I'm I'm very much uh, uh, blessed and uh, feeling blessed actually to uh, uh, study and. Uh, know more about this course and to, to uh, provide service to people and uh, I'm looking forward to various sessions of uh, uh, sessions like these which is uh, really very uh, thought-provoking so thank you thank you so much thank you Ms. Nitishri next we have with us Mr. Kasturi Rangan sharing his feedback Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kasturi Rangan. I'm a student of uh, PhD Department of Social Work, Self Finance in Madras School of Social Work. Um, so this webinar series on the international perspectives of social work has been uh, a very different for me because as a social worker, more than the theory and more than the practice that I'm going through, I've always looked up at uh, you know the people who have worked previously, and I've always taken inspiration from them. And from this webinar series, I could uh, look at a lot of people, a lot of uh, eminent speakers who have shared various perspectives on the, uh, you know, the international working patterns, the cultural diversity and how uh, how they work in, uh, in the uh, in, in foreign countries. Uh, so this this uh, series on, uh, you know, uh, social work practice has been very informative and very uh, helpful for me in my practice that I'll be uh, endeavoring in my future. I've also got a lot of insights on the ethical responsibilities, the practice in community health, stigma, uh, research, like the technical aspects of research in schools. And uh, today's session has been on mental health. So varied topics has been covered and this has quite been helpful for me in understanding social work in my profession. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for organizing this. 
thank you so much we have a lot of our participants giving our giving their feedback in the chat box we thank all the participants for your active and constant participation now i request professor rachel the faculty coordinator of our webinar series international perspectives in social work practice to give the vote of thanks So good afternoon, one and all present here. As we all know, gratitude is the best attitude. It's time for us to give thanks for all the good learning that we had learned throughout these webinar series. At the outset, I thank the Lord Almighty who had led us here too. On this final day of this webinar series, I extend my deep sense of gratitude to all the speakers right from day one. Ms. Anu, who shared her experience on clinical social work, Ms. Priya David from UK for briefing us on the ethical consideration that a social worker has to be aware of during practice with families and children, and to Dr. Bina Thomas, uh, the social and behavioral research consultant from NIRC, for beautifully explaining the practical difficulties due to stigma during COVID-19, and for highlighting the role of social worker in community health. My sincere thanks to Dr. Umesh Samuel for connecting the relevance of research in social work practice. Having the holistic development of children into consideration, I thank Ms. Lavanya Dinakaran from Abu Dhabi on explaining the role of school social worker attached. And finally, on this day, I thank Mr. Ernest Emanuel and Shirley Emanuel, psychiatric social workers from Sydney, Australia, for highlighting the social work practice and mental health, especially from Australian perspective. Your explanations with case examples has made us to understand the important roles of social work with more clarity. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. I thank the management, the principal, Dr. Raja Samuel, for all his support and guidance. I thank Dr. Francis, our HOD, for all his support and his guidance throughout the process. My heartfelt thanks to the organizing team, the students, Special mention of appreciation to Ms. Kritika for her tireless co coordination. I sincerely thank Dr. Sylvia, Assistant Professor Madras Christian College for helping me in finding the resource person. Thank you so much, ma'am. I thank all my well-wishers and the participants across India for your presence and participation. Hope you all had an exponential learning experience throughout this webinar series. Wish you all the best. Keep doing good and doing well for the well-being of the community. Thank you, one and all. Thank you so much, ma'am. We thank all the participants who have registered with payment for the series. All the money that you have paid for the registration is going to be donated to the migrant laborers. Thank you so much for paying and making a difference in the migrant lives. The certificates will be sent in within four days after the completion of the series, which is Thursday. We request all the participants to fill in the feedback form that is sent in the chat box of Zoom and YouTube. Thank you so much for participating in our webinar series and staying with us. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.